Acts chapter 18. Uh, this sounds just a little hot to me. Does it sound kind of loud to you guys, or is it just my ears? Okay, you're good? All right. Never mind. Things are echoing in my head. <clears throat> so, Acts chapter 18, we are in the city of Corinth on Paul's second missionary journey. So we are going to read through this chapter together. It's 28 verses. We'll have it up here for you if you don't have a Bible. If you uh, don't have a Bible here and you'd like one, uh, there's some Bibles uh, on the table behind this pole here, sort of in the center of the sanctuary. So the Word of God reads in Acts chapter 18, After these things Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a certain Jew named Achilla, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife, Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome, and he came to them. <clears throat> uh, and he came to them. So because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for by occupation they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was constrained by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. But when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From now on I will go to the Gentiles. And he departed from there and entered the house of a certain man named Justus, one who worshiped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his household, and many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptized. Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision, Do not be afraid, but speak, and do not keep silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. Now when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, This fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, If it, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or wicked crimes, O oh, Jews, there would be a reason why I should bear with you. But if it is a question of words and names and your own law, look to it yourselves, for I do not want to be a judge of such matters. And he drove them from the judgment seat. Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. But Gallio took no notice of these things. So Paul still remained a good while. Then he took leave of the brethren and sailed for Syria, and Priscilla and Achilla were with him. He had his hair cut off at Centria, for he had taken a vow. And he came to Ephesus and left them there. But he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to stay a longer time with them, he did not consent, but took leave of them, saying, I must by all means keep this coming feast in Jerusalem, but I will return again to you, God willing. And he sailed from Ephesus. And when he had landed at Caesarea and gone up and greeted the church, he went down to Antioch. And after he had spent some time there, he uh, departed and went over all the region of Galatia and Phrygia in order, strengthening all the disciples. Now a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and a, mighty, and, and a man mighty in the scriptures came to Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Achilla and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explain to him the way of God more accurately. And when he desired to cross to Achaia, the brethren wrote exhorting the disciples to receive him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. For he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. 
Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for speaking to us. Even as we've read it, Lord, we know that you've been at work. And we open our hearts now to the things that you might have for us. Lord, it always amazes me that you can take one passage of scripture and minister it in so many different ways to the lives and the hearts of those who are listening. Would you do so today and even more? In Jesus' name, amen. As we've been studying through this, we are on Paul's second missionary journey. If you guys don't mind, can you bring up that slide uh, where we have just sort of had the map up of <clears throat> what's been happening in Paul's life? We're following that dotted line, which is the second missionary journey. And as you look there in the upper left-hand corner where it says Macedonia, you see uh, Amphipolis, Berea, Thessalonica, Larissa. Uh, you see that line going down to Athens in the blue tip, which is Greece. Um, and then you see that line sort of going across the Aegean Sea over back to what's called Asia and to the city of Ephesus. So that's where we are uh, today. Um, something to note, you know, we've, we've talked about the second missionary journey being uh, a very long journey for them, probably taking a period of somewhere between three and five years for this to happen. Uh, this whole journey, when you follow that dotted line from its origin all the way back to uh, Jerusalem, is around 3,000 miles, when you consider their mode of transportation pretty much being foot, and on ships, uh, that's a long journey. And another thing just to point out as we get into the study this morning is that from verses 18 to 23, that last little section there covers a period, uh, a distance of about 1,500 miles. The reason we say that is that these, these men, these people who were serving the Lord, Paul and his team, they've given their lives to basically putting away materialism and all of that, and they're just traveling and serving the Lord. They're, they're, they pray every day. They're saying, God, what do you have for us today? Then they're going and serving wherever God opens doors for them to serve. We see today as we open our, our story, it says, and after these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. So not that far down from Athens to Corinth, um, there in that little blue tip, you see Athens sort of on the right, Corinth on the left. I think it's something around 35 miles. But as they get there, you know, Paul walks into something unique, something that he's never experienced before. And all of these cities, uh, as we've been looking at, as Paul travels from city to city, he finds sort of a different culture. He finds people responding to the gospel in different ways. And I, I find that interesting as well because I talk to my pastor friends all around New England as well as throughout the country. And it's just interesting how even here in this state, to go from one city to another, one town to another, there can be a distinct difference in how people hear and respond to the gospel. Today, as Paul walks into the city of Corinth, I feel compelled to give you a bit of a background on the city of Corinth because it is one of the foremost cities of the ancient world. Uh, it was home to uh, one of the seven wonders of the world, uh, as was Ephesus. Um, Paul, when he wrote the letter to 1 Corinthians, so as I've been telling you as we've been going through Acts, uh, you might want to write here at the top of chapter 18, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, because this is the background. This is where Paul encounters Corinth. And then I would go uh, to the letters of 1st uh, Corinthians anyway, and write Acts chapter 18 right there at the heading. So now you sort of have your own cross-reference. You know the background so that when you read these things, they will make sense to you. Certainly, um, immorality and worshiping idols and foreign gods was a common thing. But as Paul walks into Corinth, he walks into something completely different than anything he's ever experienced before. The Greeks had a term for a person who was a Corinthian. They would use this term as to live like a Corinthian, and it was a derogatory term that meant that it was a person who was completely given over to sexual immorality and idolatry. 
Corinth was a wealthy seaport city. It was of great military value. It was strategically located on the trade routes. The Isthmus Games were held there every two years, second in popularity and notoriety only to the, the Greek Olympics in Athens. The temple to Aphrodite was located on the tallest hill there in the city at 1,850 feet, known as the Acropolis. One of the unique things about the Acropolis is that there were a thousand temple prostitutes who lived there in the Acropolis and every night at sundown, those 1,000 temple prostitutes would come down into the city. As the darkness fell, they would fall into the city. There was a cult uh, that was devoted to the glorification of sex and experimentation in every odd thing you could possibly dream of. The worship of Aphrodite was taken as the worship from the worship of Ashtoreth in the Old Testament, which was taken from the Syrian worship of Astarte, which occurred during the days of Solomon, Jeroboam, and Josiah. So you can see how because the eradication of the worship of Astarte during the Old Testament times was not dealt with, and it wasn't put away as God had commanded. Here we are all these centuries later, now seeing it blossomed into something that's way worse than it was in the beginning. At the foot of the Acrocorinth, which was at the base of that mountain, was the worship of another god who was a derivative of Baal. Uh, the temple of Apollo was there, the god of music, song, and poetry. Um, that's where we have derived and we see all those statues of male beauty where you see those statues of a carved man with all of his sort of Adonis qualities and his six pack and all that stuff. That all happened there uh, in Corinth. Corinth was also a center of philosophy and wisdom like Athens and a place where open and free thinking and debate on any and everything was encouraged. Uh, there were about 200,000 people plus in this city. The previous city was somewhere around 10 or 20,000. So he's walked into quite a metropolis here. Uh, the majority of people in this city were slaves. Um, you know, just like the temple prostitutes, they did not have freedom. They were in slavery. A couple of commentators said here about entering into Corinth that Paul had seen churches grow and flourish in the moderately sized cities that he had encountered along the way in Macedonia. If the love of Jesus Christ could take root in Corinth, the most populated, wealthy, commercial-minded, sex-obsessed city of Eastern Europe, it could prove powerful anywhere. So Paul, led by the Spirit, walks into the city in Corinth, and this is what he encounters. Last thing, Corinth's reputation for wickedness was known all over the Roman Empire. In fact, if you know your Bible, in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 32, is where God speaks to and judges all of the sexual depravity. That passage of Scripture was written from Corinth. So it gives context to that passage. So here we are in chapter 18, verse 1. After these things, meaning after the things that happened in Athens, Paul departed and went to Corinth. And what does he do as he walks into the city? He stumbles upon a certain Jew named Achilla, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome. There was a period of time there, of course, Rome being the center of the Roman Empire. Um, the Jews were causing sort of a stir and uprising there in Rome. He didn't command them to be uh, expelled from Italy, just from the city of Rome. He was tired of dealing with them. He didn't want to hear about their Jewish issues and their Jewish God. And so he expelled them. And this was about two years prior to this point in time. So Paul kind of stumbles upon this couple here. And of course, we know that with the Lord, there are no coincidences. And as he comes to meet them, verse 3, so because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked for by occupation, they were tent makers. Why was tent making such a big deal? 
Well, as people traveled and went from city to city and town to town, uh, sometimes there would be inns to stay in. We know this from the story of Jesus, but often there would not be. So you would carry your tent. If you traveled on a ship, the ships were not like the ships we have today. They weren't like cruise ships, and you could choose what deck you wanted to be on and what amenities. Usually you were traveling on a cargo ship, and you had to stake a claim somewhere on the deck. And so you were out in, in the open, exposed to the elements. People were allowed to bring their tents and to pitch them on the deck during their times of travel. And uh, with people traveling like that, of course, a, a tent was a wear item. It would wear out. So there was a healthy demand for tents. And so Paul, uh, being a good Jewish boy, uh, every Jew, every rabbi was taught that regardless of the ministry or whatever they were doing as a part of their family, that they would always have a, a solid trade to fall back on. So Paul was a tent maker. Uh, we know that Paul was born and raised in Tarsus. We understand that in Tarsus, there was this uh, breed of goats that had black goat hair and they had incredible qualities for water repelling. And here, in this region of the world, tents were made of leather. And so Paul uh, had to be skilled in working with different materials. So as he meets this couple, Achilla and Priscilla, we presume from the reading that they were believers before he met them. And they were also Jews, so they had something in common. So as he met them, they began to sort of form an alliance to form a relationship. And so Paul and they building tents and, and sharing their lives together, sharing their lives in Christ. Verse four, and Paul reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. This is what Paul always did, right? If there was a synagogue, he would go there first and he always had this rule in his life I would go to the Jew first and then to the Greek or then to the Gentile. And he did that out of respect for the Lord, but also out of his desire, his passion for his countrymen to come to faith in Christ. And so he enters the, the synagogue and he persuaded both Jews and Greeks. He reasoned with them. Paul, as he talked with them on the basis of the Old Testament scriptures, and we talked about this in the past couple of weeks, he would reason with them. He would debate with them. He would ask them questions. He would ask how they came to that understanding that they had of the scriptures. And so there was this not only debate, when we think of debate, sometimes I think we have a negative connotation around debating. Uh, debating can be a healthy thing where people are taking different points of view and questioning your point of view. Uh, sometimes today, because we're just so weak, when someone questions our point of view, we, we tend to respond more in anger and withdrawal. But you see, if what you believe and why you believe it can't be tested and can't be scrutinized and you can't explain it, then what is it that you believe? And remember, Paul, as he was in Athens, he was reasoning with them and debating with them, and he was invited to speak there in the public place. And so his faith, our faith, has to be able to stand up to reason. And we need to know why we believe. In fact, there's a good series of books called Know What You Believe and Know Why You Believe It. And I, I recommend those books to anyone who would like to, to become better at understanding our faith. Verse 5, when Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, you remember earlier as Paul was traveling down to Athens, he was sent out of the city because of the threat of violence. Uh, Silas and Timothy had been left behind up in the region of Thessalonica. And so as he, he got off the ship in Athens, he sent word back and he said, hey, send those guys to me. Now, Paul was in Athens for a period of time, a week or two, we're not sure uh, how long the time was, probably a couple of weeks. But uh, he had sent for them, but by the time they came, he had already gone. So he uh, certainly had left word. And so they find him now in Corinth. So when Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. Remember, Paul was alone in Athens. And as he walked through the city of Athens, he was compelled, he was moved of the Spirit 
And it was probably a little bit against wisdom that he did what he did, that he ministered alone in that city. But God protected him, God delivered him. And so now as he gets to Corinth, he, he's going sort of as he went to Athens, sort of alone, he walks into the city, God introduces him to two people, Achilla and Priscilla. And now Silas and Timothy come. And so God is bringing the reinforcements, he's bringing the people alongside him to encourage him, to help him. Remember that Old Testament story of Moses as God was using him and the Lord brought a couple of people alongside him to hold up his hands during the battle? That analogy, that was a real thing of course that happened, but that analogy is something that we all need in life when we're talking about the ministry, when we're talking about churches or ministries such as we heard uh, Jed speak about this morning with their ministry there in, uh, in Tbilisi in Georgia. A great thing that his brother-in-law and their family are coming alongside. That's like Silas and Timothy coming in. And so having people of like mind, people who know the Lord, people who are committed to the things of God. Paul kind of went from zero to having four now on his staff, so to speak, who are coming alongside him to help him. And so Paul was compelled by the Spirit as they arrived. And I, I would sort of surmise that what's happening here that as the Lord is moving in uh, Paul's life, he's also saying to him, look, I've brought you some reinforcements. I've brought you some encouragement, some people to hold up your arms. And so Paul was compelled by the Spirit. He was moved by the Spirit. And he testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. Now, we're told that he was already doing that. He was reasoning with them and speaking with them in the synagogues. But as these men come alongside him, he becomes emboldened. He has support, support in the spirit, support physically from the body of Christ in the form of these four people. And so he begins to, to boldly proclaim, to testify that Jesus is the Christ. Notice what Paul is doing. He's talking about Jesus. He's saying Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Messiah. And understand something today, as we talk about witnessing to our friends and being a good witness to those around us, um, I hope that our witness is more than just, you know, I'm in the lunchroom and then somebody sees me bow my head and pray for my, my lunch. I hope that as God opens the door and people say something to us, that we will take that step and be bold with them. We don't want to be, you know, brash and offensive, you know, unnecessarily, but in the end, isn't it about Jesus? Isn't it about Jesus being the Messiah, being the Christ? So you see, eventually, if we're going to be a witness, at some point, the conversation has to turn to Jesus. Who was Jesus? Have you heard of him? Do you know who he is? Do you know who he was? And so Paul, always wanting to get to the subject of Jesus. Verse six, but when they opposed him, and we should expect opposition when we talk about Jesus, shouldn't we? This is what happened to Paul. Everywhere he went, he was opposed. He would speak about the Lord. There would be some who would believe, and that was a wonderful thing. That was a good thing. It was fruit unto the name of the Lord. But also there was opposition. And notice it says, but when they opposed him and blasphemed, Understand that the word blasphemed, you know, we've, we've talked through the Gospels, Jesus talked about the blasphemy of the Spirit. The word to, to blaspheme means to speak against, or basically to deny. So they are speaking against the idea that Jesus was the Messiah, because that's what Paul was preaching. So they weren't blaspheming Paul, they're blaspheming his message. They're blaspheming the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. But when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to them, your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. They had rejected him in such a way. We haven't seen Paul do this before. He, he's been rejected in other places, but there was something unique about this rejection that he performed that Jewish custom of shaking the dust off of your feet. You may remember when Jesus sent out the disciples two by two, 
that he gave them similar instructions. He says, as you go into these towns, and as you go there, if they will not receive you, then shake the dust off of your feet and go on to the next town. The idea was carrying the contamination of the Gentiles. That was the old Jewish idea. Jesus is now looking at it saying, if they will not receive and accept the gospel, if they will not receive who I am, you know, you've done your part, you've sown the seed, you've spoken to them about who I am. But if they will not receive, shake the dust off and move on to the next place. Notice here how Paul says to them, and it may sound a little harsh to our Eastern, rather Western 21st century mind, your blood be upon your own heads. Hey, I've come, I've told you who Jesus is. I've ministered in his name. You've rejected it. So when he says your blood be upon your own heads, you know, that's pretty serious. That's, that's saying to them, you're rejecting the Lord. You're re rejecting the Son of God. And notice what he says there. He's saying, I am clean. What is he saying there? He's saying, I've done my part. I've done what I can. I've loved you. I've prayed for you. I've told you the truth. I am clean. And you know, all of us can say that, can't we? Not just because we're forgiven by Jesus, but because if we've done what he's asked us to do, which is to be his disciples, to go into all the world, Matthew 28, and make disciples and share the gospel, and go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth, if we will take the message, then we can say, I am clean. In this particular situation, we now see him saying, from now on, I will go to the Gentiles. In the very next place, he goes back to the synagogue because his heart is for the Jews. But he's reckoning with the fact that God has called him to be the minister of the gospel to the Gentiles. One commentator shared this, and I thought it was worth repeating. Whenever God is blessing a ministry you can expect increased opposition as well as increased opportunities. In 1 Corinthians 16, 9, Paul wrote, For a great and effective door has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. After all, the enemy gets angry when we invade his territory and liberate his slaves, as in Thessalonica and Berea. The unbelieving Jews rejected the word, stirred up trouble for Paul and his friends. Such opposition is usually proof that God is at work, and this ought to encourage us. In other words, if we're not seeing or encountering any opposition, we probably ought to be a little bit concerned. Are we really sharing the message of Christ and the gospel? Because if we are, it is something that people will reject. In fact, that's probably a reason why we don't do it, because of the fear of rejection. That's a very real thing that we all experience, isn't it? How many people, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, love to get into a conflict with someone? When you think about your friends, those that you want to win to Christ and those you want to minister to, you don't want to see them kind of in your face saying, you know, your faith is just a crutch and whatever things they might throw at you. Hey, there's not only one way to God. There's many ways. Jesus is just one way. And then you tell them, no, it's not true. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There is no other way. <clears throat> and so we don't want to have these, these conflicts, these confrontations. But as I read the scriptures, it seems to be saying, <clears throat> there's no way around it. There's no way that we can share the gospel and have people smile and nod their head politely, even if they disagree with us, and just turn and walk away. I, I rarely see it. Although I've had very few people like scream and spit in my face, but usually if they disagree with you, they'll tell you they disagree with you. But this is something that we need to be prepared for. So verse 7, he departed from there. He entered the house of a certain man named Justice, one who worshiped God, whose house was next to the synagogue. So this man, Justice, a worshiper of God, if his house was next to the synagogue, that usually means he was basically the guy who took care of the synagogue. He was the, the curator of the facility. He took care of everything. He made sure everything was in place. He kept it clean. 
He was a worshiper of God. And so Paul kind of leaves the place in the synagogue where he was ministering, where he shook the dust off of his feet because they were rejecting the message of Jesus, the Messiah. And he goes literally right next door on the other side of the wall. And he begins to minister there in the home of justice. Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his household, perhaps even through the influence of justice. Maybe he was hanging out in Justice's house as Paul moved over on the other side of the wall. This man Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, an influential man to say the least, believed on the Lord with all his household. And many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. This is what Paul was accustomed to, going into a, a town or a city, talking about the Lord, going to the synagogue, encountering the opposition of the Jews, but finding some who would believe. And so here it's beginning to happen. Remember in Athens, there was just maybe four or five people as we ended that story last week who believed on the Lord. Here, now he's seeing many of the Corinthians hearing, believed, and were baptized. Notice here that after they heard and they believed that they were baptized. It, it was so common during this period of time that when people believed on the Lord that they were baptized immediately or nearly immediately. Now the idea of baptism, if you're not familiar with it, is what we would call water baptism. Remember at the beginning of Jesus's ministry, there was that man, John the Baptist, John the baptizer. And he was preaching the, down by the Jordan. He was preaching a gospel of repentance. Repent for the coming of the Lord is at hand. And he was the one who was preparing the way for Jesus to come. And what he was doing was baptizing people for the repentance of their sins to prepare their hearts for the coming of Jesus. But after Jesus came, and as he said in the Great Commission, again, uh, baptizing in my name, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You see, water baptism, and there's a great passage if you want to read it, it's in Romans chapter 6, those first few verses, where he, Paul talks about the significance of water baptism, where we are making an outward proclamation to as many people who, as who are present that my life has changed, that I now believe in Christ. And so water baptism is an outward sign of the inward reality. Water baptism wasn't essential to salvation, but it was an obedience to salvation. In other words, you don't have to be baptized to be saved, but we, in obedience, get baptized because we are saved. And so it's, it's the bumper sticker of our life. I'm baptized, I belong to Christ, in fact, when we have baptisms, it's often, you know, with the church, with believers, but I think one of the, the best witnesses we can have when someone is baptized is to invite all your family and friends. You know, Jed was talking about in uh, his video that they had a church picnic and they had everybody invite friends. So they had a lot of unbelievers invited to their church picnic and, so that they could sit around and talk about spiritual things, talk about the Bible, talk about Christ. In our baptisms, having people come who don't know the Lord, and then hearing that word of testimony from the person who's being baptized, you know, because we, we always ask, you know, there's no prescribed method, by the way, there's no book on baptism on how you do it, but asking people, do you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? Letting them say something about why are they doing this? This seems like kind of a bizarre spiritual ritual. Why are you doing this? I'm doing it because here's what the Bible says. And I want people to know that as I go down, Romans 6 explains this, as I go down underneath the baptismal waters, I'm buried with Christ. And as I come up, I am raised to the newness of life. I have new life in Christ. And my being wet represents the washing and the cleansing of the word of God and the spirit of God. And then as it says in 1 Corinthians, the old things have passed away. As I come up, behold, all things are made new. It's a great witness. It's a great testimony to people. And so many of these people, they heard, they believed, and they were baptized. Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision, verse 9. Do not be afraid. 
But speak and do not keep silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in this city. You know, whenever we see, especially in the Gospels, or the appearance of an angelic being, one of the first things they have to say to the person or the people that they are appearing to is what? Fear not. Why? Because there's fear. And I might be fearful, you might be fearful if an angel appeared to you and you knew it was an angel. There's that, that, that holy sense of awe and reverence and maybe even dread that you're in the presence of holiness because that angel being a messenger of God has just come from the very throne of God to give you a message or to speak to you. Here in this case, the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision saying, do not be afraid, but speak and do not keep silent. Why? Hasn't it sort of been the pattern of Paul's life that as he went into a city, not only was he threatened, but often he was actually beaten. Remember Philippi? He was beaten pretty severely there, he and Silas. So it's entirely reasonable that as Paul comes into this city, remember that little background I gave you at the beginning. I mean, this is a hedonistic, heathen, pagan city in, on steroids. Corinth is the forerunner to Las Vegas. Paul comes into this city. Apparently, there is some fear in his heart that the Lord needed to speak to. Paul, do not be afraid, but speak. The Lord is speaking to him about the things that were going on inside. Paul was having some fear around speaking. What's going to happen if, I, if I'm as bold here as I was elsewhere? This is a big city that's 200,000 people. What's going to happen? I just don't know if I can take any more punishment. I'm just so beat up. I'm so tired. I have so many wounds and scars and aches. The Lord speaking to him, don't be afraid, Paul. Speak. Do not keep silent. For... Here's the reason, right? Why is he saying to him, you should do what I've asked you to do? For I am with you. Man, presence of God. Do you know that God is with you? Do you understand that as his son or daughter, if you've believed in Jesus Christ, that he now indwells you by the power of his spirit, that he said in, in the book of Hebrews, reinforcing Old Testament truth, I am with you, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. Remember on the prophecies around the coming birth of Jesus? Emmanuel, God with us. Maybe we forget that he is with us. He is with us. God speaking directly to Paul, for I am with you. Therefore, go and do what I've asked you to do. And he says, and no one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in this city. As I read that verse, what leaps off the page at me is that situation with Elijah in the Old Testament. Remember, he had boldly gone out and slain the 450 prophets of Baal, and he was very bold in the Lord. And then Jezebel came out and she said, I'm coming for you. I'm going to get you. You're mine. You're dead. I'm going to have your head. And what did he do? He turned, tucked his tail and ran. And as we follow that story of Elijah, we find him in a cave hiding. And the Lord speaks to Elijah in that cave. And what does he say to him? He says, why are you here? He says, well, Lord, I'm the only servant you got. Right? I've been ministering in your name. They're coming after me now. There's a bounty on my head. Jezebel said she's going to take me out. Lord, I'm the only one left. And what did God say to him? No, you're not. I've got 7,000 consecrated, holy people set aside for my name that you don't know anything about. You trust me. I'm the one who has the resources, not you. And what does he say to Paul here? No one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in this city. Now, as we're going to go on in this story, he's not just saying, I have other believers, other Christians. You see, God can use carnal means. God can use people who aren't believers, can't he? Throughout the Bible, he uses people who are not believers. 
for his purposes. So the Lord's addressing this problem with Paul. And what's the solution to fear? It's to realize that God is with you. What do you do when you're afraid? Go, go read the Psalms, man. They are so full of this. What, what, whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. Pray that prayer back to the Lord. Why? Because he's with you. Now, something that stuck out to me, I was hoping to get through this whole chapter. I don't know if we're going to make it. <laughs> when I read this about how God was speaking to Paul here in this moment, it just made me think about, and maybe we should take a moment and pause and think about how does God speak? How does he lead us? How does he minister to us? Because listen, if we're believers in Christ, don't we want to hear the voice of God? Don't we want God to lead us in the things that we're doing in our decisions? Don't we want him to speak to us? Don't we want his blessing on our lives? What's happened, and I'm just going to pretty much focus on the book of Acts. What has happened so far since the beginning of the book of Acts? What are the examples of how God has spoken and how he has led and how he has ministered? These are just some of the things I came up with just going back to Acts chapter 1 and flipping through and scanning and reading through it. So this is under the heading of how does God speak? How does God lead? Prayer. Praying. Seeking the Lord. Putting our needs out before God. Saying, God, what am I supposed to do here in this situation? How should I move? How should I, should I spend this money? Should I buy this car? Should I buy this house? You know, whatever it is asking God's direction. We've seen many examples of people waiting upon the Lord, waiting for the Holy Spirit to speak to them. Many even fasted as they were waiting upon the Lord. They were waiting for the power of the Holy Spirit to come upon them. Remember in the beginning, they were baptized with the Spirit. And then from that point forward, they were having to be continually filled over and over and over with the Spirit. That's something we need to do. How do how do I expect to hear the voice of God if I'm not filled with his spirit? And one thing that they did that up to this point in time, meaning the disciples, the apostles, the believers, they were full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. So they acted in faith. They moved in faith. They were obedient to the things of God, the things that God has already spoken in his word. They were also obedient to when God spoke to them a word to do something or to go somewhere or to do something. You see, being obedient, being faithful is a way that we continue to hear the voice of God. One of the things that jumped off the page at me is keeping things simple and straightforward. We have a unique and innate ability to complicate things, don't we? We do. But when you read this, I think it's simple and straightforward. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. What's complicated about that? Serving the Lord faithfully, being active and involved in his work. Don't hold back. Just as the Spirit spoke to Paul here, you know, don't, don't hold back in fear. You, you step out in faith. You speak because I am with you. Praying for boldness, isn't that something we've seen over and over from these disciples as they encountered opposition and as they were persecuted? The Holy Spirit spoke to the apostles, to Peter, to Ananias, to Paul, to John, to the disciples, to the elders. Don't think that just because the Lord spoke to those people and you're not one of those people that he won't speak to you. You see, he desires to speak to all of us. He foremost and primarily speaks to us through his revealed word. Absolutely. But does he also speak in other ways? He does. They were laying hands on people, taking risks of faith, raising up people into positions of leadership in what we might call today from our high and mighty learned point of view, uh, being risky and unorthodox. Yet they took a risk of faith and saying, I see something in that person. You know, none of us is a completed work, are we? None of us is, has arrived. 
We're all in process. So, so God wants to invest in our lives. And who is the person that God will use? Is it the perfect person? Is it the person with all the looks and who could be on the cover of a magazine? No, God's looking for a person who's available, a person who's faithful, a person who's willing. It's not our outward looks. It's not any of those things. It's just as when he, he speaks uh, in 1 Peter 3, speaking to wives and how women often have these insecurities, he says it's, it's not the outward adorning and the appearance, it's the, the hidden qualities of the inner person in the heart. You see, God looks at the heart. They humbly submitted themselves to one another. It's one of the reasons I felt like we needed to do what we did this morning. Coming before one another, James says, hey, Bring your needs to one another. Pray for one another. You know, it doesn't take an elder or whomever to lay hands on someone to pray for them. We are empowered to pray for one another anytime, anywhere, any place. They worship. They praise the Lord. They took a bold stand for Christ. They did not shrink back in the face of adversity, even though they were tempted to do so. I also wanted to mention a passage of scripture here out of 1 John chapter 2. I'm going to read these two verses to you. You may have heard them, but I'd like to explain them for a moment. John wrote in 1 John 2.20, he says, But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. And then later in verse 27 of that same passage, he says, But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you. And you do not need that anyone teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. Again, under the heading of how does God speak? How does God lead? What John is talking about here is the, the work and the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. This word anointing that he uses here is only used here by him. And it means, it's an interesting word here, and I want you to listen to this, an ungent or a smearing of a special thing. And so in the case of like a, maybe like a salve, you know, that's very smelly. Like, think of Ben Gay, okay? Everybody kind of has that image in your mind, you know, that strong menthol smell, and you got to put it on the right place, and, you know, it burns if you get it in your eye or anything like that, but it's a very powerful smell. So this idea of anointing is that God has smeared us with the Holy Spirit. The idea is that he's marked us by the Holy Spirit. And you know why that makes sense? Because he says in 2 Corinthians that we are an aroma for Christ, doesn't he? From, from life to life for some people and from death to death for others. And so when he says here in 1 John 2, this anointing which you have received, he's saying, if we don't quench it, if we don't grieve it, and those are things Paul talks about in both the book of Ephesians and in the book of 1 Thessalonians, the anointing of the Spirit, the work of the Spirit will work in your life and he will lead you, he will guide you if you are open to him. So the Spirit speaks to Paul. He encourages Paul, move forward, obey, do what I've called you to do. And it says here in verse 11, and he continued there a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. Up till now, whenever Paul went somewhere, both on his first journey as well as up to this point in his second journey, the longest he was ever anywhere was about three weeks in Thessalonica. Prior to that, it seems that he was in places for only a few days to a week, maybe two at the most. Now he reaches the city of Corinth and the Lord just pauses him there. And he says, you're gonna be here for a while. So he continued here a year and six months, 18 months, teaching the word of God among them. Later, we're gonna find out in Ephesus that he was there for three years. So in, F, in most other places, a, a couple of weeks. In Corinth, 18 months. In Ephesus, three years. Verse 12, when Gallia was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat. This phrase for judgment seat is the same phrase that's used in 2 Corinthians 5 that talks about the Bema seat of Christ. And that's in 2 Corinthians 
5, 9, and 10, Therefore we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. And it's regarded that the Bema seat of Christ is a place of receiving rewards, while the great white throne of judgment in Revelation chapter 20 is a place of judgment, and that's the gateway to being cast into everlasting darkness into the pit of hell. But this term judgment seat that he uses here is that same phrase, and he says in verse 13, this fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. People have been saying this about Paul for a long time now. And when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or wicked crimes, O Jews, there would be reason why I should bear with you. Now remember just a minute ago, the Lord appeared to Paul in the night and he says, don't worry, speak. And I have many people in this city. Verse 14, let's read this again. And when Paul was about to open his mouth, what was Paul accustomed to doing? Okay, I've got to defend myself. But what happens in that moment? Gallio intervenes, who's not a believer. And he intervenes and says to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrongdoing, so basically he just puts them out and he says, listen, these Jewish things in your law and whatever, I don't really care about it. Don't bother me with it. I'm not going to judge it. You go judge yourselves. I'm out. So Paul didn't even have to defend himself. In this strange way, God used Gallio to defend Paul and protect him and say, Look, he's not breaking any laws, leave him alone. But if it is a question of words and names of your own law, look to yourselves, for I do not want to be a judge of such matters. And he drove them from the judgment seat. Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. It's like just to spite the judge. They bring this guy back, and they beat him. And they're like beating him in front of the judgment seat, in front of the judge. Like, what are you going to do about this? Bam, 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 beating him up. And he's like, yeah, I'm not interested. That's your problem. You guys go do what you want. And so the Lord protected Paul. Gallio took no notice of these things. Now, it's interesting that this man Sosthenes, that they took before the judgment seat and beat him unmercifully and unjustly. Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1, what does he do? Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother. Wow. Was Sosthenes a brother when he was beaten? I don't know whether he was or wasn't. In the end, he became a brother. He became a believer in Christ. And so certainly Sosthenes could be ministered to by Paul because Paul himself had been beaten many times for his faith in Christ. So we uh, made it not quite halfway through. Uh, We'll have to pick it up here next time in verse 18, but I encourage you to read ahead. And as I've said to you, as we've been going through this, you know, read the the passage that we're we're in that city. So go read uh, 1 Corinthians for bonus points. You'll get extra stars if you read 2 Corinthians. And kind of get a feel for what's happening, for what the Lord is doing as he's working and moving as Paul and his team are are just following the leading of the Lord. We're going to find some really cool things here in these last few verses from 18 to 28. There's so much here for us, we can't get into it this morning. But the Lord spoke to Paul, and I don't want us to miss this this morning. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I hope you've carried a lot of things away from what we've been talking about, but definitely take that with you. Whenever you're tempted to be afraid, to fear, call upon the name of the Lord. Why? Because he is with you. If the Lord had to speak that to the great apostle Paul, don't we need it as well? Don't we have fears as well? Don't we have fear of speaking like Paul did? It's hard for us to think that Paul had a fear of standing up before people and speaking, but he did. It's evidenced by what the Lord spoke to him. And so we need to listen to these words written in red in your Bible, where the Lord Jesus spoke to Paul. And so by implication, I believe he speaks to us.
Lord, thank you for your word this morning. Thank you that you have been faithful to minister to us, to speak with us, to encourage us, Lord. And as we draw this time to a close, Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters here who need a touch from your hand, who need a a word of encouragement from you. I pray that you've brought it this morning. For those who are connected to us, Lord, whom we love and long for, to give their hearts to you, to come to be believers in Jesus Christ. We lift them up right now before you. And Lord, I'm sure there are many. And may you empower us, Lord, to open our mouths and speak. Give us the words of wisdom, the words of grace. Lord, help us to not compromise the truth of the gospel as we speak about who you are to others. And Lord, we know in these last days, with the craziness that's happening in the world around us, it seems like the, the lines between light and darkness and truth and a lie are becoming more and more defined. And Lord, may we not shrink back. May we not be afraid. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. For those who are listening today who maybe have never put their faith and their trust in you, Jesus, we pray that this might be their moment where they in their own heart right now would just reach out to you and as it says here, that they would believe, that they would receive, they would come to that saving faith, they would cast their cares upon you, that they would realize in coming to you, the savior of the world, the only way for their sin to be forgiven is by the blood of Jesus Christ. And we pray that they would give their hearts to you right now. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness, for your faithfulness, for your love. In Jesus' name, amen.